Hello, it's Andrew Eborn here for another episode of Lives on Lockdown. I'm delighted that today my guest is orthodontist Claire Nightingale. Okay. Claire, it is so lovely to see you. And it's lovely to see you as always, Andrew. Fantastic. We are in extraordinary times. How are you coping? Well, I'm, I and my family are absolutely fine. I think before we go any further, I do want to stress that I haven't overlooked the sadness, you know, that many people are experiencing. And this morning when I logged onto my NHS emails, there was another email about a member of staff who had died at Watford General Hospital. So, you know, I don't want to overlook the fact that I am privileged, you know, with, with having health and a continuous income during this lockdown period. Um, so that's what I want to start off by saying. I do recognise the dire straits that other people have been in and I share my sympathies enormously with them. But on a personal level, you know, it's been an opportunity for me and my family to spend some time together. And I have been working in many ways on my business just as intensively as actually when the business is running. No, absolutely. And it is an important message because everybody behind the statistics, there are lots of personal and very, very tragic uh, stories and, and for everybody as we always say who has been affected that by this our thoughts and prayers are with you now putting this into context you yeah. um by way of history you are uh, an orthodontist uh, not only that you are orthodontist of the year 2019 how did that come about <laughs> oh well um i was approached by a media company to take part in their competition and um, so i submit answered a questionnaire they spent some time looking at my website, looking at the type of work that I do. They read the testimonials of my happy patients. And uh, I was very fortunate that that was the accolade they awarded me. No, oh, fantastic. And, and how's it judged? Uh, well, I did phone them to verify that there was some weight behind the honour, I must say. And I was persuaded by the response that, I, that they had a team of experts, including various professors in health-related uh, uh, sidelines um, and beyond that I don't know a lot more but but I, I can guarantee on the night there were smiles all round oh absolutely beautiful yeah. smiles at that which beautiful is all smiles. good yeah ever improving smiles very good very good um, now you I, mean, I, I was reading a bit about your history I mean you were inspired to become an orthodontist when you were quite young you were at 12 at the time weren't you I was yes indeed I, I so I grew up in the 1970s in Durham City and at that time there was a vogue for taking out kids' baby teeth under general anaesthetic in the dental chair. So at the age of about eight years old, my mother whipped me off to the dentist. She was instructed to bring a scarf with her. I was gassed in the dental chair. And when I came round, the nurse wiped tears away from my cheeks, took the scarf from my mother and used it to tie a wedge, a wedge of gauze in front of my mouth. Um, and off I was sent home wobbling on a bus. And amazingly, despite that terrible experience, a year later, my mum got me back to do the whole thing again. And then a few years later, we moved to North London and I was sent off to a specialist orthodontist when I was about 11 years old, who identified that I was crowded, made a recommendation to my new dentist to take some teeth out under local anaesthetic. And it was the most transformative experience. There were no nightmares, there was no blood, there was no pain, there was no gas, there was no wobbling home on the bus. And it was such a transformative experience for me that at that moment I decided that that was what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I would become an orthodontist. Oh, fantastic. So I, talk talk yeah. me through the process then of a 12 year old girl um, yeah. being impressed by the, the, the care and attention that you received. What did you yeah. have to do? What, what's, what's, the, what's the means by which you then become an orthodontist? Well, uh, having made a decision at such a young age, in many ways it made life pretty easy because the rest of the requirements, the GCA, the O-levels actually, I will acknowledge my age, the O-levels that I had to, um, uh, to do, excuse me one moment, we've got some people in the house working for us. <laughs> but this is what we love about these things. There we it? go, yes. The people behind you, so on and so forth. <laughs> yeah. My home office. Hello, what's he got? <laughs> Our very kind builders was coming in to sort it out. Anyway, so yes, yeah, so I had to choose my O levels. So it was very, very clear that I was going to do science O levels. And actually, I don't know that I'm a natural scientist, to be honest. I would have probably chosen arts if I hadn't already made my mind up that I was going to do dentistry. I then went, I did A levels. I had to, chemistry is the absolute key for getting into dental school. 
Um, so I then did, I got into Newcastle, which was actually originally my fourth choice on my own. Well, the, the great thing about that as well, Claire, is that you say it right. <laughs> well, I am the daughter of a Geordie. There so you go. It's the one gesture I still have towards my northern roots. Well, I, I can um, tell you, I went to Durham, and so often us southerners always used to say Newcastle, which is totally yes. wrong. Absolutely, you'd be a complete misfit there, Andrew. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I mean, a, a story that I don't know if I've ever shared with you was that I was inspired to go to apply to Newcastle because a friend of mine, I was still in touch with a friend from my junior school days who said she wanted to do medicine. And I thought what fun that would be to go off to, uh, to Newcastle to do, dent to do dentistry while Judith did medicine. She, however, so I went off, put it fourth choice, loved the building, loved the moor outside and decided that was where I wanted to go. She, on the other hand, changed her mind completely or perhaps didn't get the grace to do medicine, went off to Leicester Poly and did a performing arts administration degree. Further to which she then set up uh, tea in the park as uh, some years down the line and retired very early before the age of 40 with her entrepreneur husband. So, they had, so our lives from a common starting point turned out to be very, very different. Um, but, but she is the reason why I ended up in Newcastle, where I had uh, five very happy years uh, doing dentistry, um, followed by a year as a house officer. Then, but I was still determined that I wanted to do orthodontics. And at that point, I then had to jump through some hoops. I had to sit two very difficult exams to become a fellow in dentistry of the Royal College of Surgeons. Further to which I then had a stringent interview and about three and a half, four years after I qualified as a dentist, I was accepted as the first year of a new master's degree at Bristol University. So I took it, having been offered my place, I then packed in my job and went off backpacking around the world for about eight months, knowing that I had my secure uh, training to come back to. And on return, so in October 1993, I then started a very intensive three-year master's degree at Bristol, uh, during which I had to then do membership in orthodontics exams of the Royal Colleges in addition to my master's exams and thesis. So that took me through to 1996. And then I faced another crossroad in my life because I didn't know at that point whether to go into specialist orthodontic practice or continue higher training to become an NHS consultant. So always want to create a rod for my own back. I decided I would do both. So I then spent uh, four more years training as a senior registrar, came to London at this point and went to the Eastman Dental Hospital, uh, partnered with Queen Mary's University Hospital, Roehampton. And finally, in 2000, at the end of 2000, just before I gave birth to my first child, I finally accredited as a consultant in orthodontics. And then there was a natural, and then there was another natural pause because I went on maternity leave without a firm job to return to. So I then, it then took another three or four years before a part-time job in London came up that was the right one for me. So after about 15 to 18 years of training, I guess, from, you know, having started dental school at 18, I then was uh, appointed to my first consultant post in my late 30s. And so I quite in terms of yeah. the training that you do, what is the difference between uh, a dentist and an orthodontist? Um, well, a, a, an orthodontist, a specialist orthodontist, is someone who's gone through a long period of specialist training, whereby we understand the biomechanics and efficiencies uh, of moving teeth. So as a general dentist, general dentists can do orthodontics, but they haven't had the in-depth training and experience and passed qualification, stiff qualification exams to become recognised specialists on the General Dental Council register. Okay, no, but very, very interesting. So you went through that very lengthy process and, and I admire anybody from the medical profession, lots of the professions, like uh, whether you're an accountant or a lawyer or, and so on and so forth, you don't get a job for a very long time. It's a lot of training, a lot yeah. of work and so on and so forth. What was your first job after you'd finished qualifying? Uh, as an orthodontist or as a dentist? Uh, uh, my, yeah, uh, as both, in fact, maybe. Well, my uh, as, a, as a general dentist, my first job actually was as a house officer. So I was appointed one of about six or eight from my year group that were appointed to house officer positions in the dental hospital. So, you know, one day we went from having to have 
a, a signature of a member of staff before we gave a local anaesthetic to that was on a Friday and then on a Monday we were paddling our own canoes on the clinic so that was quite a shock um, and I was very obviously it was great to stay within the nurturing environment of the hospital in which I had trained um, but my first job as an orthodontist bizarrely another little twist to my life story was actually back in Pima which was the town in North London where I grew up and I my father had said to me oh there's an orthodontic practice just opened up around the corner why don't you go and knock on their door so I literally turned up at this practice with my CV in hand asked to see the orthodontist and lo and behold got myself a job at, at opposite the very secondary school where I had I might say been head girl uh, when I was 16 years old so bizarrely in my very first job qualifying as a specialist I ended up treating some of the kids of my peers from my own secondary school that made me feel very old oh. <laughs> well I haven't yet treated the grandchildren <laughs> that, that, it must be it must be interesting. talk about if you remember it your very first patient yeah. obviously not mentioning names because of client confidentiality how does it make you feel yes. having trained for so long to actually have a mouth open in front of you and you're the person there's a lot of trust you put in dentists um but when they get an orthodontist when, when they basically are, are messing around in your mouth uh, how did it make you feel well um look there's never a moment of, of, of approaching something new where you're not to some extent apprehensive of course but you know we had by the time we're let loose on the public under our own steam we have had many years of supervision and so I suppose the truth is it was probably quite liberating actually you know to be in the driving seat as well as a little bit nerve-wracking um, but um, I, I, I think dentist, acquiring a dental degree and then somewhat latterly and a specialist within orthodontics is a little bit like learning to drive. You pass your test, you get on the road, then you learn to drive because you have to get yourself out of your mistakes and your fixes and your near misses. And that, that's the analogy. I think it's the same in dentistry and orthodontics. Now, at the moment, obviously, people can't go to the dentist. You hear of um, terrible reports of people having to pull out their own teeth and so on and so forth because yeah. it, it is so painful. I presume that's the same with orthodontics. Uh, well, look, again, it's a privileged position to be in because, lo and behold, we've discovered that pretty much most orthodontic emergencies can be self-managed at home. And one thing that has really impressed me in this pandemic is the efforts of the British Orthodontic Society to produce some fantastic little uh, videos on their website, which are basically how to get yourself out of trouble for patients. They're DIY SRS uh, tutorials, and they're fantastic. We've got a little bit of drilling going on now. You might hear the background. <laughs> uh, sorting out a damp problem. Um, it's a little bit of drilling, but not the dentists. Not the dentists, but I suppose like, it should make me feel at home. Hey, I'm back at work in another context. Um, so I, I, as an orthodontist, I have been fortunate compared to my colleagues because my patients have, of, of which I, I've had very, very few people contact me for advice with emergencies in actual fact. And those that, I, that have, been, have been reassured by a FaceTime call with me and we've been able to send some wax in the post or direct them to the British Orthodontic Society videos and they've been able to self-manage their problem. However, I do have immense sympathy for my colleagues and their patients where they, that my colleagues who have not been able to help their patients who are in genuinely abject pain uh, with flared, flared up dental disease uh, which cannot be ameliorated by the way in the way an orthodontic problem can so I, I really feel for my colleagues and the public at large that have been suffering from toothache in this period yeah, it, it must be very, very difficult. And you mentioned, and we'll, we'll put the website at, at, at the end, but uh, what, what was the website again that people need to go to? Oh, the British Orthodontic Society website. And they have a COVID-19 advice section with some very helpful videos for patients. Okay, that's very good. Well, some of, some of the top tips then, if people are watching this with the usual disclaimers about uh, individual situations, what, what are the big, biggest problems that people could self-manage? In, in orthodontics? Yes. Yeah, in particular. Okay, well, a little bit of wire digging in, that can be a real source of distress. So if a wire has slipped around from one side to the other or untwisted and is digging into the cheek, but that, that can be remedied temporarily by covering it with wax. 
And the orthodontic society were ingenious in recommending if you haven't got any orthodontic wax, buy some cheese that's covered in wax and use that wax. So there you go. Nothing can be all at the same time. A bonus. Exactly. Just go and get some Edam. <laughs> I thought that was pretty ingenious. Other, other brands are available. Oh yes, you're quite right. Let's <laughs> wax covered cheese. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very good. So, so it's mainly white. And what about dentistry itself? Because people are having fillings falling out and so on and so yeah. forth. What should they do in that situation? Well, the first thing to do, excuse me, we've got a ladder coming through. Yes. <laughs> the first thing would be obviously to contact their own dentist for advice. Okay, so their own dentist should be the point of contact and will be able to triage their problem. So if the dentist can't sort it out, if, if there are some urgent dental care centres which have opened up, um, I can't be specific about exactly where. It seems to be um, uh, something that's been very difficult for people to access, but uh, urgent care dental centres that have got uh, some PPE um, have been able to provide some dental care, but it really seems to have been limited largely to the provision of antibiotics, uh, painkillers, and advice, um, or to dental extraction. So, very difficult to actually get. Um, totally appropriate dental care at the present time. And then in addition to that, sorry, the, the, the dental hospitals in central London, I believe, are also offering an emergency service, but in, in a very limited capacity. So I spoke to someone at Guy's who said they're seeing the first 30 patients that turn up by 8.30 in the morning. Okay, and those are the real emergencies. But if somebody's just had a feeling that's fallen out or something, is there something that they can do for themselves? Uh, well, there are sort of temporary filling kits that you can purchase, but I mean, uh, the best thing to do, contact your dentist for advice. Okay, That's very good, perfect. and thank you for that. Now, big change obviously is happening, and, and we get new announcements from the government all the time. We're no longer being told to stay home, stay at home. We're being told to stay alert, and uh, I know you for long enough. I know you've never not been alert. So that's Thank important. you very much, Andrew. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so always a thrill. But tell me what, what's going to happen when the restrictions ease off and people then can go and see their orthodontist or their dentist again. Yeah. Think about PPV. How do you see that coming back? Uh, well, I have been fortunate to be part of the buy-in group. So I put in a very large order for PPE only last week. So PPE, as we all are aware from the news, has been very difficult to come by. Um, however, I have now put in an order for some masks, aprons, etc. Uh, and actually, I sent an email out to my patient group last night explaining to them that irrespective of Boris's announcement last night, um, which I felt would give them the idea that we were able, able to open immediately, that the limiting factors on us opening as dental practices would be the arrival of our PPE. And also we have to we have to fit mask test our staff. So we have to be certain it's not just acquiring the PPE, but we have to make sure that it actually fits us uh, so that it genuinely offers the protection that we need uh, uh, from our patients and also to prevent transmission between the dentists and, and the staff and the patients as well. So um, I am first, I've obviously prioritized my PPE purchase. Um, next week, I have also enrolled on a course so that I can actually become something called a fit mask tester. So not only will I be... You to say. I, yep. I, <laughs> so I will be able to test my staff, myself, to make sure that their masks fit properly. But also the reason why I'm doing this is because if my supply of masks runs out and I have to change to a new brand, I need to go through the process again of testing to make sure that uh, the masks are appropriate. Um, so once the PPE is in place, I'm then structuring the return of the opening of my business in according to the patients who have the greatest need to see me first. So patients that have contacted the practice with emergencies are obviously going to be given the first appointments if they can make it. And then in consecutive order, the patients that have waited the longest to see me. So I've, I've got some patients that haven't seen me since the end of January. So that's nearly six months by the time we get a chance to reopen. So I'm going to be ordering my diary over a period of three to four weeks, starting with the patients that have been waiting the longest for, their, for my attention. Okay, and, and very, very interesting. And for the people who haven't been able to see you, is that going to have a big detrimental effect? Well, I think that providing that they have maintained a good standard of dental health, um, providing that they have been careful with their brace so that they haven't broken it in any capacity, 
Um, I think we've got every reason to be optimistic that their treatment will have continued to progress even though we haven't seen each other. Because actually, providing that um, we keep in reasonably regular contact with patients, by which I mean that we see people every two to three months, they don't disappear for six to 12 months without seeing them, um, we're in the lucky position that orthodontics just keeps carrying on, the teeth keep moving on the whole. Uh, and by the time we do get out of lockdown, um, let's assume that two months will have disappeared between, well, and it, clearly it will be two months between the, the day I closed and the day I reopened. You know, if an average course of treatment is 18 to 24 months, that two months isn't a dramatic loss of treatment time in actual fact and is analogous to a standard summer holiday. And it's quite often the case that my patients will disappear at the start of June and not return them until the end of August, early September. So in reality, I think I'm going to remain the optimist that I am and think I've got every reason to think that everybody will have continued to make progress even though the practice has been closed. Very good. And any indication, have you been given any special indication of when people will be allowed to go back? Uh, well, that's what we're waiting for. You know, I, I, the, the announcement last night was a little bit too vague for my um, tastes. And I imagine that the, the regulators, the, the, the leaders of the dental profession and the regulators will be interpreting what, and giving us some guidance over how we might get back in the near future. But, the, but clearly the acquisition of PPE is key. Yeah. So, you know, even if we're given the thumbs up, if there's no PPE, we can't open. Right. Okay. So um, we'll we'll get you back on the program uh, if, if you're happy to do that, and yeah. keep us all updated. Um, but just to finish with Claire, um, yes. the top tips that you would give for people during this time who have had orthodontics work, um, what should they be doing? Clean their teeth. Be careful with their diet. Wear their elastic bands. Uh, great advice, Claire Nightingale. It's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you too, Andrew. Thanks for the invitation. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, that was Claire Nightingale uh, joining us. Do join me, Andrew Eborn, next time for more Lives on Lockdown.